Good morning, Just Church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. You could be anywhere, but you chose to be here, and we are grateful for it. Uh, this week coming up, we have our men's and women's meetup, which is on Ring Central. You can access that through our Facebook, and also I. Uh, I actually send out an email every single week and you can get and you can get it there as well. Guys, we are so so grateful that you're here. Uh, we want you to be able to enjoy church, enjoy the whole worship experience. And so uh, my advice to you is to set set your everything else off. Just focus in if you can. Take notes Close your eyes when you do when you're worshiping, and really just just take it all in. I mean, you're in the comfort of your own home, and you're able to just be able to to breathe free, be free, and uh, scream and shout and do whatever you want, and that is amazing because our God is amazing. Uh, if I could have you guys just bow your heads and close your eyes, Lord God, thank you so much for another beautiful day. Thank you so much for just. Um, giving us your word to be able to open up and to uh, to be able to grow closer to you, Lord. We are grateful and thankful for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Guys, I don't know if you noticed my shirt. We got a little bit of a football game going on tonight with just the best quarterback of all time playing. And he's going to win. I hope.
Lift up a shout and praise. Amen. Amen. You are who are on the winning side. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. That is the wish of the Lord upon us. And uh, this song means a whole lot to me. Um, because it was, it was a song, it was a verse brought into, into me by my parents. Uh, a little while back, we were at, at, at devotionals and, and it just hit me. I, I've been listening to the song for a little bit and, and it just hit me at devotionals one day. Um, my parents used to um, say that to me all the time and, and uh, just the importance of those words is so, so powerful to wish a blessing on somebody. So this morning, we just want to wish that upon you as the Father is bestowing upon us.
and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you. For a song, I talk about how much I love it. Um, but this next song, So Will I, um, holds a very special spot in my heart. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the words and just how powerful it is. But um, the first time I heard this song, when it came out in, I think, 2018, I just fell in love. I mean, the song was just so intricately put together. And um, it's just favorite it probably is my number one favorite song and I just love it so much I could listen to it a million times and never get sick of it and so um last year when I was in Honduras for three months and uh we had we had just lost Ray last March and I had a really hard time listening to worship music after that I I don't know why I knew that you know God was still good and I I still was strong in my faith, but I, I just really struggled. And my aunt posted this song on Facebook, and I, I clicked on it, not really wanting to, but I clicked on it. And just listening to the intro, I just 
burst out into tears because I just knew how powerful this song is and just the words you know that we sing with this song it just proves how good God is and I just I love I just love this song and so I invite you to just really listen to the words of this song there's so many so many different ways that it's spoken about just all the beauties of this earth and you know just how wonderful the creations are that God has made for us.
Pastor Rachel here. I am so super excited to be back here with you all. Um, I am here recording the message in our, our church space today, and we have a few of our production team here, so it's super exciting. There's actually people present, so so that's awesome. Um, John and I are back uh, from Arizona, and so we are uh, not necessarily excited about the snow, but very excited to be back with you all and hopefully looking forward to being able to physically gather together once again uh, really, really soon. Um, we just finished up a great series called Keep the Change. And, and in that series, Pastor James taught us about not only how to make meaningful change happen in our lives, to make godly changes, um, but also to help us to keep those changes going. And so I know it's really hard now that we're, we're working remotely only, but I want to I wanna just encourage you that if you haven't been keeping up with those messages, to catch up with them, because there's some really, really great stuff in those. And on Sunday morning, we have been building such an amazing community online. It was a little bit hard to kind of get that moving at first, but now there's so many people on there. We're all getting to interact. Frankly, for me, it's a real treat because even when I'm here and I'm, I'm talking to all of you, I love doing that, but I don't have the ability to comment real time like I do when we're online on Sunday morning. So if you're not joining in with us, you're really missing out on some of that community that I think is lacking right now during this time of being separated. So I would just so encourage you to join in with us um, and come together on Sunday morning if you can and watch live. Um, all of our past messages are on both our YouTube channel as well as on our Facebook page. So I would encourage you, like I said, if you missed any of those, to catch up and, uh, and just get some of that godly wisdom uh, that we've been talking through. So we are starting a brand new series today. And this series is called Come Together. Now, hopefully, we've come into this new year, we've taken some time to see what changes we might need to make in ourselves and so now we're going to change our focus a little bit, and we're going to talk about our relationships with others and taking into consideration what we've all been going through and dealing with for almost a year now. Almost a year. That's a long time. Um, and I want to recognize that, and I want to honor that. And I know we're in 2021. That's a new year. I don't want to start raising any bad memories, but, but I still think we need to recognize that we've been through a lot of things over this last year. 
and, and, and we need to address them. We can't just sweep them under the carpet and hope that they go away. If anyone has done any sort of step work in recovery or any sort of just personal growth work, you know that unless you really dig into something, unless you clean it out and you make sure that you are actually healthy, it's always going to rear its head again. And we will not come to a place of unity and forgiveness without doing this as well. And that's what this whole new sermon series is about. So I want to recap some of the obvious things from the past year that we have been through. Uh, First and foremost, obviously, COVID. We have been through it. We are still going through it. Um, And I just want to recognize that by mid-March of last year, of 2020, most places in the world had started to close down, had started to shut down due to the pandemic. And this was totally unprecedented in our lifetimes. No one alive today has lived through something like this before. And it has affected all of us in one way or another. Some people lost their jobs, their incomes, their businesses. Some people actually lost loved ones. Others lost a whole sense of normalcy, right? And and, and there's been a medical impact to many, many people. And so this has been a really significant thing in all of our lives, no matter what the impact was. And then just when you thought nothing else could happen, nothing else could get any worse, um, we experienced something else that was probably unprecedented in many of our lives. When we saw the tragic deaths of Breonna Taylor, of Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and too many others, and brought the attention to the fact that there is an ongoing serious problem of racism in our country that there's injustice, there's disproportionate treatment of certain people for no other reason except for the color of their skin. And if all of that wasn't enough, then we pull politics and the election into play, right? And and this was the most divided election ever, and certainly in the history of my life, and and I would say perhaps even in the history of our country, or at least in, in recent history, and, and the election was obviously followed by events at the Capitol, which were definitely unprecedented in our lifetimes. And, and it brought us to a place as a country where we're not only separated physically, but divided relationally from one another in a way that many of us have never, ever, ever experienced. And so we're going to start this series talking about something that's absolutely necessary, for all of us as Christ followers to be talking about and to be intentionally working towards, and that is unity. And so we're going to start in the book of Micah. Micah was a prophet in the Old Testament, so you're going to find this in the Old Testament books. Old Testament, again, is all of those books that led up to Jesus' life and ministry and afterwards. So this is from Micah. It's from chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so I'm asking God to help us as a church family to figure out what does this mean? What does it mean to seek justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? And I can tell you, it's not going to mean that we're all going to agree on everything. That's, that's not unity, okay? And, and some of you may be familiar with the 12th chapter of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And, and in this letter, Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. And he talks about how there's many parts to the body, how there's a foot, how there's a hand, how there's an eye, there's an ear. And he talks about how each one of them has a specific purpose and a function, And what would happen to the body if one part wanted to do the job of another one rather than doing the job that it's purpose for? And and we are the same way. We all have different gifts. We all have different purposes. We don't look the same. We don't talk the same. We don't think the same. But we have the opportunity to be united together as the body of Christ. And you might have heard us say this before, but we believe in unity in diversity, right? That's what we're talking about right here. And in that same chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 12, verse 26, Paul says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And so what that means is if one of us is hurting, 
if one of us is suffering, if one of us is being treated unjustly, every part of the body suffers along with that part. And there are so many around the world that are suffering, that are grieving, that are hurting beyond description. And as the body of Christ, that should bother us. And, and, and I'm not talking about needlessly taking on the burden of other people's suffering that you have no control over. But I am talking about concerning ourselves with the things that concern God, about having our hearts broken for what breaks his. And I can tell you right now, I prayed that prayer once in my life. I said, God, I just want to see with your eyes, and I just want you to break my heart for what breaks yours. To see things through your eyes and to have my heart moved by what moves your heart, God. And it is a powerful and a dangerous and a glorious prayer. And through that prayer, he took me to a place called Honduras. And I experienced things that I can never adequately describe. Um, And it's not that I can't adequately describe because they were bad things, but the depth of the things that I experienced, the sadness, the love, the humility, the joy, it's beyond anything that I've ever, I've ever been a part of before. So if we're not concerned about those things that go beyond ourselves, go beyond our own four walls, we're really just about our own work and not the work of our Father. Paul told us in another one of his letters, the letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Now to some that comes easily and to others not so much. And I have to admit, me, I I feel emotions very, very deeply. For my Enneagram people, I'm going to delve into that for a minute, but I am an Enneagram one. We are very, very closely connected to the Enneagram fours. The fours are those feelers. They've got those big emotions. Um, And so as a one, I have a real connection to that. And I feel my emotions real deeply, but I'm not always very comfortable with feeling those emotions like our fours are. So sometimes I try to stay away from them. I try to lock them away because I know that when I do feel them, they're going to be deep. And I know that's hard for some of you as well to feel those feelings. But I'm asking you here to come together. And that means to rejoice with those who rejoice and to grieve with those who grieve. Feeling how hard that is and doing it anyways. And during these trying times, it is certainly no exception because the true test, especially in difficult times like these, is how we treat others, okay? So let's talk about COVID one time, okay? Let's just, let's just concentrate on that right now. You know, during this pandemic, it has been really difficult to navigate things, right? People have very different views. They're very personal. You know, on on just broad ends of the spectrum, there are those who take every possible precaution, who don't leave the house, who just feel like they need to just be in their own personal space and they just can't take any chances. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have those who don't even believe COVID exists and they're not going to put on a mask and they're not going to be limited by that. And then, again, you have those who desperately, desperately want the vaccine and they feel that they've, they've just got to do anything they can to get it. And then you have those who adamantly refuse and they're not going to take the vaccine. And then you have a whole bunch who are just in the middle, just trying to make the best decisions based on the information that's available. And, and, and we as a church family here at Just Church, we've tried to be as careful as we can. We've tried to balance things out. We've tried to be fairly conservative with getting together during COVID. We had a couple scares and we felt that we needed to start going remote. We've been remote for almost three months now. That's crazy. Our last in-person service was November 8th. That is a long time. We really, really miss one another. We really miss you. And I'm, I'm very optimistic that that time is coming to an end soon. But I can tell you honestly that I don't hold any judgment or any bad feelings against other churches who made different decisions. This is an unprecedented time and we're just all doing our best to get through it. We're not going to agree on everything all the time. And we need to be prepared to extend love and grace 
to one another. Even, and maybe especially, when we don't agree on how we handle things. All right, we've talked about COVID. Let's talk about racism now. Let's just take a minute. And I understand again here, there's going to be a lot of different views on the events of the past year. And I totally respect that. But I do have to say, I've watched that video of George Floyd. And I don't know if you have or if you haven't, and I'm not telling you necessarily to go and do that because I know it can be very, very difficult. But it's almost, it's over eight minutes of him telling the officers that he couldn't breathe and asking for help. And I told you, I do emotions very deeply. I can't, I can't watch things that are troubling or explicit or anything like that. And I got to tell you, when you see something like that, that's not something that's happening in some far off place that doesn't have anything to do with your life. That's another human being suffering. And when I saw that, the way I felt was more than shocked. It was deeper than grief. It was indescribable sadness. And that's the very essence of My Micah 6 8. In incidents like this, we are called to do what is right, to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Now, I just want to make sure that we're clear on a couple of things that I am not saying here. First and foremost, I'm not talking about taking sides, okay? This is not about blaming law enforcement at all. In fact, this is really not even about police officers because it's about all of us. It's about recognizing that racism and certain wrongs exist. And are there some bad police officers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there some bad pastors? Absolutely. We're going to find imperfect people in every area of life. People doing hurtful things to one another. And I don't believe you have to choose a side here. You can be wholeheartedly against racial injustice and fully for honoring police officers who go out there day after day, seeing terrible things and making huge sacrifices and doing what's right. So I'm not saying that we need to cho choose sides here. And that brings me to the second thing that I am not saying. I am not saying that those who are struggling and oppressed are more important than any others. Let me put it this way. John and I had four kids. Y'all probably know that. Most of you probably know them. Um, we love all four of those kids. And over the years, they've all had their own struggles. They've all had things that they've had to deal with. Some have been more impactful than others, more traumatic than others at different times. And in those times, when one of them was struggling, when one of them might have been mistreated, when they were going through those difficulties and that suffering, we had to focus more of our attention on one child versus another one. Doesn't mean we didn't love all four of them at that moment, because we absolutely did. We just needed to focus on that child at that moment, because that was the one that was in need. And I'm going to tell you, that's biblical, okay? We always go back to the words of Jesus, and we talk about it, and we sing about it. Jesus specifically talked about the 99 sheep and the one. Why does he leave the 99 to go to the one? Because the one is the one that's in trouble. Because the one is the one that's vulnerable to attacks. Because the one is the one that needs him. And it isn't that that one is more important than the 99. It's not that he loves that one any more than the 99. But that one is the one that's in need at that moment. So I am not saying that those who are struggling and oppressed are more important than any others. But I am saying they're the ones who need all of us to stand up for them and be a part of the solution. And so we pray for those who are treated unjustly. We pray for those who serve us bravely. And we pray for those who persecute others wrongly. Right? Jesus said that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, he said, But I tell you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. Now, we may not all like this verse. It may be our natural tendency. 
to want to seek revenge, to think poorly of those who treat others badly. That, that's, that's kind of our carnal nature. Our, our, our natural reaction is not to extend love and grace, right? To those who maybe hurt us, to those who hurt the ones we love, to those who, who do things that go completely against the things we believe in. And that may be one of those verses that we just like to take our scissors and kind of cut right out of the Bible, right? But you can't avoid it because Jesus said it. And no matter what translation you read, I guarantee you it's going to have the same meaning, okay? I just read to you from the NIV, but I can tell you, even if you read from the proper version, the King James Version, it's going to say, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, well, that's the King James Version. Let's switch over to the message. We're going to look at the contemporary now, okay? What does the message say? Message says, I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer. For then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves, right? I love that version because it tells us that by loving our enemies, we're truly coming into who God made us to be. So you can't get away from it. No matter what translation you read, it's the same thing. We love our enemies. We pray for our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us. And speaking of which, speaking of enemies, we might as well throw politics into the mix here. And we're going to touch on this a little bit more next week, but I'll give you a little sneak preview here, okay? I don't care what political affiliation you are, Republicans are not your enemy. Democrats are not your enemy. We all have an enemy, but it's not who we often make it out to be, right? The Bible tells us who our enemy is. Funny enough, it never mentions political parties. It says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have an enemy. Let's not forget who that is. More on that next week. So at its core, as I said, this series is about unity. And so I think it's a fair question to ask, how can we, you and me, right here, right where we are, Work to bring unity. And I have a few thoughts on that. The first thing we need to do, in light of everything we've been talking about, is recognize and admit when injustice exists. Let's take racism, for instance. Just because you haven't seen racism doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I can easily sit here and say, well, I've never experienced racism. Well, no kidding. Look in the mirror. If my skin was any more white, you could see through it, right? So the fact that I haven't experienced racism is not a surprising thing. But I can tell you, I've worked as a corporate attorney in the corporate world for almost 20 years now. And I can tell you sexism exists. I've experienced that firsthand. We can't be a part of the solution to the problem if we don't acknowledge that it exists, if we don't acknowledge that injustice exists. And you know what? If you're in recovery, you know what's the first step. Denial, right? Denial. Admit that there's a problem. And this can be hard. It can take humility. It takes the ability to admit that injustice exists outside of our own little bubbles, that we may not have seen it, that we may not have experienced it that we may have biases and different perspectives. But there's power in recognizing that and putting words to it. Because when you know that something is a problem, you have to have open and honest discussion about it. We know that drugs are bad, and, and we talk to our kids about them, right? We have an open and honest discussion, and we tell them, hey, don't do drugs, they're bad, right? Well, racism is bad, too, so we should have a discussion with our kids and say, hey, don't do racism, it's bad, right? I mean, that, those are the kinds of things that we can do. We can have those conversations to help our kids know that everyone is created in the image of God. All right, so that's the first thing, is recognize and admit 
when injustice exists. The second thing we can do to bring unity is to listen. Listen to someone who has a different story than you. Listen to someone who has a different perspective, a different background, and ask questions. Don't just listen to be able to refute what they're saying, but listen to understand. Listen to understand how their life has been impacted by their background, how their views have been impacted by their experiences. And you know what? You may hear some stuff that makes you uncomfortable, but some of the most powerful moments in our life happen when we experience things outside of our comfortable little bubble, right? Outside of our circle. So we admit when injustice exists and we listen to other people's perspectives and stories. And the third thing we can do to bring unity is to pray. We already touched on this a little bit. I want to read to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. And it says, then if my people, and this is God talking, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. Now, I don't know about you, but when I start to think about these issues like, like racism, like sexism, like the, just these big, big ticket issues, which are systemic in nature, right? They can be so big, it can seem overwhelming. And it can seem like we can't make an impact on our own. And that's absolutely true. We're not meant to. We need help from heaven. Right? So as we talked about earlier, we pray for all. We pray for those who suffer injustice. We pray for those who perpetrate injustice. In John chapter 17, starting in verse 20, Jesus himself said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Unity, unity. Jesus prayed for this unity that we may be one as he and the Father are one. We pray for those, not just those in the body of Christ, not just those who know Christ, but those who don't yet know Christ. We pray for unity with them as well. And you know, sometimes we get into the habit as, as Christians of, of, of looking at other people's actions and we sit there and we wag our fingers and we expect that they should act the way we want them to act or we expect others to act, but we can't expect those who don't know Jesus to act as if they know Jesus. It's a really simple concept and we need to remind ourselves that over and over and over, right? Right? Because Jesus said, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Because then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them even as you loved me. And this brings us to our fourth and last thing that we can and need to do to bring unity, and that is love. Right? Love. It always comes down to love. How do we love well, here's my easy answer. It comes with adver adverbs. Remember those adverbs? They're this annoying part of speech in the English language. They, they end with L-Y mostly. So we love overtly. We love recklessly. We love boldly. We love generously. We love unconditionally. We love bravely. We love actively. If you see injustice happening, do something. Say something. Stop it. Stand with those who have experienced it, those who've been mistreated. Express unity through love. Express love to those who have perpetrated wrongs. Show them who we are by the way we treat others, 
We can't respond in anger. We just can't. We can't fight wrongs with wrongs. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12 says, Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Love covers sin. It dispels anger. It drives out fear. It forgives. It heals. It unifies. So as followers of Christ, when one part of our body suffers, all suffer. The only way to be united is to stand with and for those who suffer and to pray with and for those who suffer and for those who cause that suffering and to love all. That's how we do what's right. That's how we act justly. That's how we love mercy. And that's how we walk humbly with our God. And this will be to be continued next week. We're going to keep talking about unity and how to come together as the body of Christ. But for now, I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me. God, we just thank you for the time to join together here today. We thank you for your word, for the wisdom and the guidance and and, and just the amazing ways that your spirit is able to reach each and every one of us through your word over and over again in new ways every single day, God. It is is absolutely amazing. And, And I thank you personally that every single day I find something new in your word to help me to understand more about who you are, about who you call me to be, about how you call your people to treat one another and to just share the love of Christ with all. And God, I pray that you would give us opportunities to do that throughout the week. I pray that as we go throughout our week, that, that this message would resonate, that it would, it would penetrate our hearts and our minds so that we would remember to do these things, so that we would remember to love others, so that we would remember to pray for those who persecute us, that we would remember to recognize when injustice happened and to listen to those um, who have a different story than we do, to understand where they're coming from. And above all, God, just to recognize that we're not always going to agree, but we can still be united by the power of your Holy Spirit through the blood shed by Jesus on the cross and the love that you poured out there. We thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to come before you, to to pour out our hearts, to to worship um, you, to um, just be united as your body of Christ. We thank you for the gift of the church. And just pray that you would continue to um, strengthen our leaders, to to guide us through the presence of your Holy Spirit, and just show us the way to go so that we may continue to share your word with others and just add to our number, um, as you showed us in the book of Acts in the early church. God, we thank you. We praise you. We lift all of this up to you in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Good morning, Just Church. So good to be with you here today. We're getting closer and closer to having in-person services. Uh, we've, we had uh, worship and preaching all recorded all at one time with some spectators. So that's a step forward. Uh, Massachusetts is starting to loosen up their restrictions. So that's encouraging. And I'm very hopeful and prayerful that we will be meeting together um, soon. Uh, the leadership and the pastors are talking about this and we're trying to be smart and safe, but you can believe us when we say we are eager to get back together with you all because we love you and because that corporate worship worship experience is so critical. And that will be a great, great day when we do. But for now, we're doing online again. Uh, you can see in the background, if, if any of you are techno geeks, I'm working on uh, preparing the service to be live streamed tomorrow. And that's where I take all the different portions of the recorded services uh, and stitch them together and try to make them look pretty and uh, exciting and fun. And that's what we watch on Sunday morning. So that's this stuff in the background. Uh, and what I'm recording right now is going to stick right in there as well. So I'm here really for two reasons. The first is to invite you to go to the website address that you see on your screen here and fill out our online connection card. 
You can fill out, you know, your name, any info that you want to give is fine. Uh, we'll take your questions, comments, concerns, and especially your prayer requests. And we'll uh, treat those with privacy, but we will pray and we do pray. And um, it's a powerful means of, of getting more people behind you spiritually in dealing with situations that you may have in your life or, or situations of friends and family or whatever. So go there, fill it out, let us know what's going on. Uh, if you have questions, we'll answer and um, it will be helpful in us knowing who's out there. And it'll be helpful for you in knowing that there are people praying for your needs or um, you know, just doing whatever we can to be present for you, even in these days when we're not physically present. The second part is for me to uh, thank you, as always, for your continued giving to the church and to take this time to pray over your offering. Um, if you've been sending in offerings and tithes, thank you very much. Um, we have our online giving, which again, there's a website listed below. Uh, you'll see a mailing address where you can send in checks as well. Uh, and these things are really critical. It's easy just to think of this as, uh, you know, a monetary act or a financial responsibility. But you have to remember that when we give into God's kingdom, it's a spiritual act and not just a physical act. And it's an important one. It helps us remain humble. It helps us uh, recognize who our provider is and who our creator is. Remember, God is the owner of everything and everything we have is his. And really all he asks of us is to give back 10%, which has been, you know, his uh, method of operation since really the beginning of um, time, the beginning of establishing his people on the earth. So it's a good thing to do that. And I realize that it can be sacrificial for many of you. Uh, and I realize that these can be tough times and I don't want you to feel guilty if you can't do what you want to do, but do something. If, because it's a spiritual act, do something. If you're saying to yourself, well, I can't give, you know, the $50 that I typically give every week, give a little bit because it will show your commitment uh, to God and to yourself and it will resonate as an act of worship. Um, I don't want to make this sound like a, you know, a plea to give up your money. At Just Church, we, we don't really care about your wallet. We care about your heart. And so that's why whenever I try to deliver a prayer for the offering or an offering message, it's, it's balanced between not trying to push you, but at the same time, this is an important part of our ministry. Uh, it, it's an important part of our service. It's an important part of our life living in the kingdom and serving God. So there you go. Um, if you have given online or if you're preparing to give, um, if you have anything physical in your hand, you can hold on to it. I love it when we take it and we hold it up to God and pray. But you can do that right in your heart. Just lift up your tithes, your offerings uh, before God right now as I play, pray, please. So, Father, we thank you so much that you are a good, good God, that you always provide for us. Lord, that we can trust you, that we can look to you for everything that we need. God, as we just come together as a church and we give thanks to you through our offerings today, uh, thanks that you have brought us together as a church. Thanks that you are always providing for our financial needs for the church, so that we can help many, many people uh, and that we can continue to do the work that you've called us to do. And we're especially thankful, Lord, that we uh, are, are people of God that through the blood of Christ, we have been redeemed, we have been saved, and that we know we have a place in heaven with you. And we know that uh, when you look upon us, you look upon us with love, and you look upon us through the righteousness of Christ. And in those things, we are so, so grateful. So we thank you today, God. Bless these offerings. Multiply them into um, your kingdom, that many, many great works would be done as we give you thanks for these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So church, thank you. Uh, join in as we finish up with our last song today. It's a good one. Uh, thank you to the worship team for being so faithful and doing such a fantastic job. Uh, it's a great thing that God has provided for us in this place called Just Church. So love you. Really do. Looking forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Like
Pastor Rachel said today, we must leave the 99 to go out and help the one. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good.
loving me recklessly, for loving all of us recklessly. During these trials and these difficult times, you are constant. You are love. In Jesus' name.